President Trump's senior advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, says he'll cooperate with federal investigators. The FBI wants to know more about meetings Kushner had after the election with the Russian ambassador and a banker from Moscow. This is happening as the White House plans to shake up its communications team, including a new plan for responding to the Russia investigation. So to break it all down for us, we turn to CBS News political analyst Jamel Bowie. Jamel, uh, the FBI is honing in on Jared Kushner. Considering how close Kushner is to the president, what are the implications for the White House here? I think this is a major problem for the White House if Kushner is in fact under investigation, if that's the kind of investigation that leads to sort of a criminal investigation of Kushner, then he'll probably have to leave the White House or at least take a much downgraded role. And given how much President Trump relies on Kushner both for advice and for simply organizing the White House's activities, I think that would be a major blow uh, to whatever President Trump is trying to do. Indeed. So the White House apparently is working on a new communication structure. They're supposed to present it to the president when he returns from Europe. In your estimation, what needs to change? I think the biggest thing that needs to change is there needs to be more professional staff and help in the White House. One of the striking things about the Trump White House compared to other Republican White Houses, whether George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush or Ronald Reagan, is just the distinct lack of any kind of longtime Washington operators. Now, it's easy to say that President Trump came here to change the system, to turn things up, but it, 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 is, it is a fact that there is expertise needed for the organization and management of a White House, and expertise simply does not exist. And so if this new communication structure involves bringing in more professional staff, bringing in people who can handle properly the paper flow, bringing in people who could properly brief the president, then I think it will help Trump out. But if, the, if it's just simply a PR move, then I think he'll be left with the same problems he's always been left with, which are a direct result of the fact that there just isn't that much experience in the White House and it's not even fully staffed at this point. Hmm. Uh, Jamel, the administration has been frustrated about recent leaks. Uh, will restructuring change that? I, I doubt it, right? Because the, the issue of the leaks isn't that there aren't enough loyalists in the White House. It isn't that there, uh, that there aren't enough sort of prop, there isn't enough proper public relations going on. The issue is that there is a fundamental lack of leadership. There's a fundamental lack of organization. Um, we read stories after stories from this White House of staffers having no real direction, of being completely unprepared for major news events happening that involve the White House. And as long as that's true, as long as people within the White House do not feel like they have necessarily someone at their back, uh, leaks are going to happen because leaks seem to be the only way to get the administration or at least get the president and his advisors to react to anything that needs to, to, to outside events to get them to be proactive. Um, so, again, if this is not a serious reorganiza reorganization, something that fundamentally changes the structure of how the Trump White House has been operating, then I expect the leaks to continue. And, and considering how important loyalty and trust is with him, I can't see him really, truly shaking things up completely. But I want to talk to you about uh, yesterday, NATO. Uh, now, you know, everything the president was doing and saying, uh, the cameras were watching, Everyone was sort of scrutinizing, but there was sort of one move that kind of went viral. It's when the president moved kind of from the back of the room, moving forward to get ready for a photo, and he sort of, it looked like he shoved the prime minister of Montenegro right. out of the way. I, I don't, in my personal opinion, I don't think he was really doing much shoving. I think he was just sort of finding his place, but, you know, it went <laughs> viral. T Twitter loved it, all that sort of stuff. But I want to get your take on it. I mean, the fact of the matter is he's the president of the United States and even little things like that get blown into much larger issues. So uh, how do you think, you know, other leaders interpreted that and what, what do you make of it? Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure how other leaders interpreted mm -hmm. it, but I think the extent to which people did see it as a shove, see it as a, uh, an act of disrespect is kind of emblematic of the entire tenor of that trip over to Brussels. Um, president Trump seemed to have little respect for his fellow uh, NATO allies. There is a report that he called the Germans bad or very bad, quote, his speech uh, to NATO leaders um, involved uh, chastising them for not not giving the proper payments to the United States, a, a kind of fundamental misunderstanding of the, the arrangement we have, which is that um, all NATO members are expected to spend uh, at least 2% of GDP on common defense by 2024, not make payments to the United States. 
there, there are all these, there are all these uh, actions and pieces of rhetoric that really emphasize how either uncomfortable President Trump is with our NATO allies or just outright disrespectful of them. Uh, and I think this viral shove, if it's a shove, um, it's almost irrespective of it's really a shove because I think it kind of captures this sense that uh, President Trump has some sort of antagonism towards NATO that he's not shy about showing. And it's an interesting contrast to see with his behavior in Saudi Arabia, which was much more respectful um, and much more comfortable. And so I think that contrast is something worth exploring. You know, Vlad and I were, of course, watching the speech yesterday and monitoring Twitter. And I found it very interesting that a lot of people really appreciated his direct talk. They uh, felt like, you know, maybe it's time that America was no longer apologetic. And he got a lot of praise on Twitter for bringing up um, the, the number of countries that are not meeting their obligation. Again, sort of the, the, the issue with uh, President Trump's rhetoric here is it just doesn't, it's, it's sort of a misunderstanding of what the obligations are. Uh, President Trump seems to think that the obligation, that, that seems to think that NATO is like some sort of protection racket, um, in that you pay up to the United States to protect them, for the United States to protect them, when it's really sort of a, an alliance of mutual defense with the United States as the largest stakeholder, in which everyone pays according to their ability, pays for common defense according to their ability to do so. And that the United States has long made an explicit strategic choice to be sort of militarily preeminent on the European continent. This notion that holding to that uh, strategic commitment, that sort of holding to the status quo is somehow apologizing for the United States, I think really reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of what NATO is and what the United States' role it, is in it. And so, well, I'm not surprised that uh, likely uh, supporters and fans of President Trump would applaud his speech. I think that the, the premise from which they're operating is simply incorrect. And Jamel, I want to get your take uh, on something here closer to home on that Montana special election. As you know, yeah. Republican Greg Gianforte won the House seat by six points just one day after being charged with assault of a reporter. It's also worth noting that President Trump won Montana by 20 points. Uh, there have been a lot of think pieces out there about how Democrats are poised to win uh, certain seats uh, in the midterm elections. But so far, they haven't really won anything just yet. Is this a harbinger of things to come or is this an aberration? I think this is a harbinger, but it's a, a, a positive harbinger. So in, in, a, in a world where Democrats are winning a House majority, they are not winning seat, seats like the Montana at large. They are probably not winning seats like the Kansas 4th, which, for which there was a special election not long ago. And that's because these are very Republican, deep red seats, uh, where the average Republican wins a seat by 15, 18, 20 points. And so the fact that we saw this kind of massive swing, even if it doesn't result in a Democratic win, the, the size of the swing, the relatively narrow victory for the Republican candidate. And remember that most of the, the voting was done by mail. And so yesterday's or Wednesday's assault probably had very little impact in the overall result. Those indicate a kind of national landscape where Democrats are winning uh, less Republican seats, but still pretty solidly Republican seats. Your plus sevens or your, your R plus sevens, your R plus sixes to use the common scale for that. So I think... I think if you, if you zoom out and, and look at this sort of like, what does this suggest about the landscape? What should we read out of this? It's a, a fairly positive picture for Democrats. I, I wanna add though, that one thing that was disturbing coming out of all of this was the degree to which Republican leaders had a hard time condemning the assault. Um, there, there is a, a lag between the actual event and sort of any, any kind of condemnation. And even then, the condemnation was, was kind of weak. Statements like, well, Montanans now have to choose, um, that, you know, that kind of assault is not, it's not okay, but, you know, I support the Republican candidate. And it says something disturbing to me that we're at a point as a political culture where a congressional candidate can assault a reporter unprovoked and not receive anything like any kind of uh, mass condemnation from his fellow partisans. Where do you think that that culture has developed from, Jamel? I, that's that's a really good question. It's something I'm actually trying to I'm, I'm kind of struggling struggling with myself because on one hand you can say, oh well, President Trump has been hostile towards the media. He has called them the enemies of the American people, and so there's sort of a straight line between those uh, that rhetoric and and this kind of behavior and this response to it. 
on the other hand, right, you have a uh, you have a a conservative media apparatus, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, um, assorted sort of websites that have spent years demonizing the media, not just as uh, a kind of institution that it disagrees with, but as a fundamental threat to the United States. And I think you add all these things together and you get this sort of casual disrespect and hostility for reporters that may, as it did on Wednesday, manifest itself as outright violence. Um, and in turn, when confronted with that violence, you have uh, Republican politicians who are unwilling to really condemn it in the terms that it deserves. Well, Greg Gene Forte is heading to uh, Capitol Hill, where he'll be, be a questioned lot more, a lot more. With, with so cameras and recorders <laughs> in his face once he gets to the get Hill. used to That's it. Right. Jamal Bowie, thank you so much. Thank you.